what are we capable of without their help, really? Are our own communities going to show up for this business? And the answer was yes. Imagine you just graduated from college and you have a random curiosity that starts out like an art project, but in a few years becomes a really successful industry disrupting career. Sana Javeri Kadri did that. My name is Sana Javeri Kadri. I am the founder of Diaspora Co., which is a single origin space company. She noticed the hype around turmeric, like turmeric lattes and whatnot, and started to question. Where does our turmeric come from, and is it sourced ethically? She answered those questions by starting Diaspora Co. I was curious, how did she take her hobby to market, and how did she figure out what fair pay looks like for herself, her team, and her farm partners? I'm Maya Lau, and this is Other People's Pockets, the show where I ask people about their money, so the questions we all have about how much other people make and how their finances work can be a little bit less of a mystery. Thanks again for doing this. I'm so excited. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here and chat about money. So first, tell me about your company, Diaspora Co. Um, How and why did you create this company? Yeah, so I am the founder of Diaspora Co. And I founded it in 2017, um, really because I felt like there was an opportunity to critically look at the spice trade as it's existed for thousands of years and Uh, burn it to the ground and rebuild it in a way that was Mm -hmm. equitable and thoughtful and more delicious. Um, And so this company was initially kind of a very idealistic art project about growing a better spice trade and what that meant. And then that's grown into a legit business that trades many millions of dollars all over the world. Tell me the actual story of how you founded Diaspora Co., Yeah. So in 2016, I was working in SF in food marketing and I was noticing that, you know, there was beautiful produce being sourced. Um, You you knew exactly where your gorgeous peaches came from or your tomatoes came from. But then when it came to the ethnic food aisle, which, you know, is an outdated uh, aisle in of itself, things were usually sourced really badly. And when I was asking chefs, uh, businesses, grocery stores, like where their spices in particular were coming from, they had absolutely no answer for me and were giving me like very vague, strange answers. It usually like deeply irritated me. And so in 2017, I embarked on a little bit of like a research project to be like, okay, everybody seems to be into turmeric. Where is America's turmeric coming from? Most likely it's coming from India. Great. Like who is growing it? How much money are they making? How is it being grown? Is it actually like ethically grown and sourced? And that deep dive made me realize that the spice trade hadn't changed in a very long time and that the product that people were seeing on American grocery store shelves was stale, outdated, tasteless, badly sourced, full of pesticides. And it kind of set off this mission to, you know, grow a better spice trade and see what it took to build a supply chain from scratch where farmers were being paid equitably. They were growing really beautiful heirloom seeds of um, spice varieties that were grown specifically for their flavors and their aromas. And then consumers who were, you know, excited home cooks that wanted to know exactly where their spices were coming from, who grew it. And building that supply chain has kind of been the the thrilling, chaotic four years of our life or my life. And we've grown significantly. We've added on a team. And today we source 30 spices from almost 200 farms now across India and Sri Lanka and soon Pakistan and Bhutan. I remember the only time I've been to a spice farm was in Zanzibar. Mm. And I had the total experience of like, oh, my whole life, I just interacted with spices as like these ground up powders, powders in the supermarket. And I was just it was so enlightening to be like, oh, like the the different plants that these spices grow from, like all look completely different. Like it's, you know, like did you have when you were researching that, um, did you have moments of like, holy shit, I did not know that this is how nutmeg looks when it's being grown. And then coriander looks different. Like totally. What, what um, did that look like for you? Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, initially, like when I first realized, oh, coriander is literally like 
the seed off the coriander leaf, like, or the coriander plant. Whoa, duh. You know, there was a lot of moments like that, or, or the fact that saffron is actually the, the stigma off a flower. And I think that's been mm. a big part of our marketing efforts of showing people on the packaging, on our website, that you see this little jar of powder? Well, this is the plant that it came from. That's right. crazy. And people love that. I mean, part of it is like that you are actually paying your farm partners fairly, right? Yeah. And that that hasn't been part of what has happened in the spice trade in the past. Yeah. So, I mean, historically, you know, the the spice trade has existed for thousands of years, but its most recent rendition was um, under colonialism, um, British, Portuguese, French, Dutch, all of the above, where the purpose of the spice trade was for exorbitant profits to the colonizers. Mm -hmm. And that meant that the farmers um, and the traders in between made no money. The farmers really made the worst deal. Mm -hmm. And 150 years later, we discovered that nothing about that system had really changed. And so the business became an, an exercise in how can we hand over price making um, to the farmers and say, hey, like, what do you need to make this a viable business? Mm -hmm. And if, if that's X amount, we'll build our cost of goods and we'll build the rest of our business on top of that price. Like right. whatever it takes for you to get us the most delicious product, that price is, is our base. Right. So how much do you pay your farm partners? On average, we are paying 6x the commodity price. The commodity price is a price that's kind of set based on demand and supply market factors, but it's also influenced by hundreds of years of oppression. And so we find that the commodity price is largely a useless price for regenerative, sustainable agriculture that really takes care of people. Fair trade or like a fair trade price is unfortunately only in spices a 15% premium on top mm. of the commodity price. So let's say mm. the commodity price is, you know, 100 rupees or maybe $1, then the fair trade price would be $1.15, which is not nearly enough to, to fix a system. And so we're usually paying $6 on average, like our weighted average as a company. And those are like numbers that we publish, that we make public, um, is 6x the commodity price. And you're saying $6, $6 for what exactly? For the same kilogram of spice. Okay, got yeah. it. Yeah. It sounds like your farm partners tell you you know, here's here's what it costs for us to do this. But how do you also figure out like what is a living wage to them? You know, because in the U.S., some people would say, "Oh, a living wage is seventeen dollars an hour," but that may not really be a living wage to a lot of people. So, like, how do you figure out what that is, and like, what what is it in in dollars, if you can say? Yeah, so um, it's two part. One um, with our farm partners, they are the the computer, like they're like the founder, right? They're me. They are the mm -hmm. people who own the land and run the business. And they look at their labor costs. They look at their water bill um, and they'll come up with a price that feels like they'll make a profit and they'll be able to replant the next year without having to take on a loan, right? So it'll, it, it's enough money. Their harvest will give them enough money such that they will have cash flow and like cash in hand to get them to the next harvest. But when we're talking about living wages, then the conversation really becomes about, well, what are the farm workers making, right? Because it, when, when you're talking about a worker, that's the workers who are working on our farm partners' farms. And um, the kind of average price, similar to what we would consider our minimum wage here, is uh, 300 rupees a day. Mm -hmm. So that's about $4.16 mm -hmm. per day is, is the minimum, not even minimum, just kind of the average daily farm worker price. Um, most of our farm workers, we have convinced them or they have convinced themselves over years of working with us and because of the premium they're actually giving their workers 500 rupees a day which is 6.9 dollars which is you know a significant increase in addition usually to um a place to stay and food i think that that part of our model has a lot of room for growth and like i don't think that we are in a place where i think that we or really anybody out there are like leaders in farm worker 
equity in terms of pay. Um, it's it's very similar to migrant labor here in the U.S., where it's a complicated and um, inequitable system. And I think the move to making you know giving farm workers the right to organize, giving them the right to become salaried workers, make overtime, would be really really powerful. But that's like a agricultural revolution that's yet to happen, honestly. Right, and like if the farm partners you had did and i don't know maybe they they do but like if they unionized or if they had more power would that pose a problem for your business financially our margins you know ultimately we're also in the business of getting those spices all the way across the world packaging them shipping them out to customers like we have plenty of other costs that are that are bigger variables than just raw material so i think it would mean that we would have to find other places to save money or maybe we have to increase our prices, uh, but I don't think it would break the model. The model is based on like deepening and growing equity and building a better system. So if this makes a system better, we'll change our model and make it work. And I love that because there's been so many restaurants that have struggled yeah. under COVID. And th there's been an argument though, that like if they're struggling, it's in part because they were based on a bad model to begin with. Like they exactly. relied on paying workers shit. And like, that's not really a model <laughs> to have your business based on because yeah. you can't just rely on workers, you know, not having power. 100%. I mean, I think I, I, I loved seeing Kachka, the restaurant in Portland's latest press release about how they're moving to a worker -owned, owned model, they're going to profit share, and they're getting rid of tipping, like all of those things feel like the future of food and kind of a labor system that feels more fair. And I think for us, we're dealing with things on a transcontinental level where as much as we're responding to and excited by what's happening in the US, there's very different things happening in India right now. Like actually, given the pandemic, it's allowed a lot of um, businesses to justify quote unquote pandemic wages in India where people are still working full time but making half of their wage and sometimes that's gone on for two years or more. Um, so what I'm seeing in India is actually the opposite of that right now, where I'm seeing workers and kind of the working class working more or just as hard for half the money under the guise of, oh, there's a crisis, we can't pay you and like you're so desperate for the money that you'll you'll accept it. So, I, I mean, I'm really hopeful that, that that stops and workers aren't kind of taken for granted the same way anymore. You've started this business and grown it with a lot of vision and, and big ideas and forward thinking. And at the same time, a business also comes down to like spreadsheets and yeah. just the dollars and cents. What have you had to learn about money and the financials of actually running a business? Everything. Um, my <laughs> first business plan was a pie chart, which tells you how little I knew about business or money or spreadsheets. Like, you know, the only way I was able to look at a spreadsheet was if I turned them rainbow colored. Um, so then it was like mm -hmm. fun, you, especially as a woman who was kind of told, oh, you don't have to be that good at math. It's okay. You're more artistic. And it was like not encouraged. It's been very empowering to realize the power of a spreadsheet and kind of how empowering it can be to understand how it all works and like actually where money is coming in and out. Like it's scary information, but it's also very valuable and powerful information. What are the things you wish you'd known more going into it about financial literacy? Mm, I think a, a big one was realizing like that people borrow money in order to buy inventory. Mm -hmm. um, I was so naive coming into the industry that I, I felt tremendous like guilt and loss and terror when we would sell, you know, a run of a product. Like let's say we would sell like 5,000 jars of a product. And then I'd be like, well, I don't have money for more. Like, how do I do that? I, I felt like my business model had failed somehow or done something wrong. And it was only years later that I was like, oh, everybody has that problem. Like that's where financing comes in. Like little, little things like that of like, oh, mm -hmm. that's how all the big kids do it. Like it's not meant mm -hmm. to be this hard. Those things would have been really valuable. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of have dreams sort of of starting a business. Like I, I think it would be really cool, but then it really intimidates me to think of like, how do I even have employees and guarantee yeah. that they're going to get paid and that they have health insurance? Like, where do you learn about all of that? Like, do you, do you have mentors? Like who, do you have people that you can call to be like, can you just explain to me how this is going to work? 
Yeah. I have a very smart little brother, um, and he is a big source of help where I can be like, you know, I am the creative visual human and he is the finance nuts and boltsy human and, and has been doing my math homework for years and years. And so working with him, not working, but like kind of having a relationship with him has taught me to like never be afraid to ask really stupid questions and constantly. And so I definitely have always gone to people who I admire and been like, I'm going to ask you a very specific pointed question about how you do something. And I would love if you could share. And most of the time people are so disarmed and like appreciative that it's a specific thing that they can help with rather than like a general, can I suck up some of your time that they're willing to help? Um, so I think I've definitely created a network of people that I can text or call and be like, well, you know, how does this work? How are you yeah. calculating your gross margin? What does that mean? But then I also think like, with the employees and you know the, the big scary parts, there is a part of me that feels like I just have founder brain, which is that I'm a little bit, I have magical thinking and like don't really think through these like bigger, scary things. Like I'm better at just jumping in and figuring it out. And there's definitely risk associated with that. And I think you can use that attitude only so far. Um, and then, you know, I think maybe at the stage that we're at now, my founder brain of like just jumping from one lily pad to the next without considering the repercussions of like, will we be able to make payroll are riskier and I probably shouldn't do them. But luckily at this point, I've hired people who are much smarter than me who can handle some of that stuff and be like, oh, based on these, these sales forecasts, we will not make payroll. So we should better, like we should sell something or um, we need to get a loan or something. So I think, you know, I, I'm i all for jump in for the first couple of years, take risks, make big mistakes, fail fast, um, which is also something that you have to have a significant amount of privilege to be able to do, of course, and then quickly realize what you're not good at and where you need help to de-risk things. A lot of that does take, you mentioned the privilege you had, like, what did that look like financially? Because I know that you you started the company with about $3,000 that you had yeah. a tax refund. You got an $8,000 loan from your dad, but yeah. I'm sure you still had living expenses. Mm -hmm. How did you float yourself financially during those early months or years? Yeah. So for the first two years, I wasn't working on Diaspora full time. Okay. So for the first year, I moved into a co-op that was truly horrible. And it was 12 people, two bathrooms. And the only reason I did that was to bring my living cost as low as humanly possible. We shared food. I think my rent was 500 bucks a month, including food, because we, we bought groceries and one person cooked every night. So I, when I was starting Diaspora, I wanted to get my overhead as low as humanly possible. So I I think I got it to the point where I needed $1,200 a month in order to live and, like, mm -hmm. and live fine. Like me, mm -hmm. my bike and the co-op like were keeping me afloat. And that meant that, and I didn't have any savings. I was too young and not smart enough for that. So I was working as a line cook at a restaurant in our neighborhood. And then I was also photographing and kind of doing event photography on the side. So it wasn't, you know, obviously having the skill of photography was huge where I wasn't just reliant on my restaurant income. So the restaurant was pretty much paying for all of my living costs, like that full 1200 plus my therapy bill, which is kind of my most expensive expense. And then any photography income was money that I could then put directly into Diaspora Co. for something like a small production run or jars or things like that. And that went on for a long time. Like that went on until 2019. Like I really took the leap of working full time on Diaspora towards the end of 2019 when we were founded in fall 2017 because I just needed to see payoff. Like I needed to see revenue that made it worthwhile and made it make sense. And after that, I think I started taking like enough for 2019 to 2020, I took enough money from Diaspora to pay my rent. Like once I start working at the restaurant, um, at this point I had caved and moved out of the co-op just because I couldn't humanly do it anymore. And then I, my photography was kind of covering any other living expenses on top of that. And then by early 2020, I started making like a nominal diaspora co-salary. That, that's kind of the, the nuts and bolts, but it's very, very important to mention that like my parents in Mumbai like are, are wealthy and upper class. And like without knowing that like 
yeah, worst comes to worst, I call it and move back to Mumbai. Like without that safety net, I would not have been able to do this. Like there's no way. My partner does not come from the same level of wealth at all and like has had a very different trajectory and has to put themselves through undergrad and grad school. And like it's been really kind of an enlightening process for me to realize how much privilege it took to to start this business. Yeah. And thank you for sharing that, because I I think it's so important to hear, you know, it's one thing when people just say, oh, you started Diaspora Co. with three thousand dollars in seed money and that's it. It's like, no, like there's so much more to the story. And you mentioned that your your parents in Mumbai, where you grew up, Mm -hmm. are wealthy. And the name of your company kind of references the fact that you've straddled different cultures. You've lived, you went to college in the US, you live part time in Oakland, as I understand it, and still part time in Mumbai. Mm -hmm. What kind of messages about money and wealth did you internalize growing up? And then Mm -hmm. how did that also translate to the US context and to what you're doing now? That's such a good question because I think for a long time that like mistranslation between the US and India and how like I made sense in one context and didn't Mm -hmm. make sense in the other like was my primary source of anxiety and angst in life. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I grew up in India knowing that I was upper class, that I was wealthy. I went to the best schools. We lived in a high rise apartment, like a beautiful one with a swimming pool. Um, I knew I knew what my life was and I knew that most of our conversations as a family were around like, well, what 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 good are you going to do in the world? How are you going to be of service? How are you going to use your privilege for good? Like that was my childhood of, of being very aware of that. And I think when I came to America, I was baffled because I, I suddenly I was told that I was a woman of color and a minority and I was experiencing racism for the first time. And on one hand, I had a ton of privilege. On the other hand, I didn't because I was a queer immigrant and like it was complicated and I probably made a lot of missteps too in that like translation of like, how does my privilege, what what does that footprint look like here? Mm -hmm. One of the advantages of it, I think, was that in in America, I I translated to woman of color, immigrant, okay, you must have had this really hard life. Like we're going to make a ton of assumptions about you and your background. But I had an entitlement because I grew up upper class where I was like, Actually, these are all of the things that I think I deserve. Um, like I was able to put on not my inner Karen or white lady, but I was able to put on my like inner like rich Mumbai auntie to be like, this is mm-hmm. what I would like. And it was mm-hmm. very valuable. Like you you probably weren't prepared to live in the co-op forever. No, I was not. <laughs> I was a disaster in that co-op. <laughs> um, uh, but, it, but it meant that especially in wealthy white spaces, I was really able to succeed because I brought all of the entitlement and class privilege, even if it didn't translate into dollars, it translated into attitude and like what I felt entitled to ask for um, and how I showed Mm up. And I'm getting into like confused, angsty territory with this, but all that to say, I think the privilege did track and, and I've had to reconcile with the fact that ultimately I, I'm, I'm a rich kid who is trying to just use that privilege in decent ways. Did your parents um, actually sit you down and teach you anything about money or tell you how to, I don't know, invest or anything like that? Um, No, they were very open about money, though, where they so my Mm. parents have always kept their money separate, Um, like they don't share money, they don't have a joint account. So we always knew like who paid which parent paid which phone bill, um, which parent paid for whose fees. And I think that was maybe the biggest money takeaway that my brother and I took from our childhood of like, in they had very unconventional marriage, right, especially in India, where money is kept separate between husband and wife or spouses. And uh, I think both my brother and I really admired that about them. And we're like, wow, that's, you know, it it gave my mom full autonomy to spend money however the hell she wanted, and then gave my dad to spend money however he wanted. And and it it showed us how differently they spent money and how differently they prioritized things. And also showed us how if they had shared it, like, there likely would have been tremendous conflict that, that they prevented by keeping it separate. Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. Again, because you've straddled different cultures and there's kind of different definitions of class um, in in all of them, what class do you consider yourself to be in now? 
I mean, I think I identify as upper class. I think it would be kidding myself to not say that. I own a home. I'm 28 years old. Definitely upper class. You're actually, you know, that it's like very rare for people to say that, like people who are in the 1% like often still say like, oh, I'm like middle class or I'm upper <laughs> middle class. <laughs> what does it feel like to come out and say that? <laughs> no, I mean, I think in India, you're so aware of it. Like mm-hmm. it's so obvious that to not say it here feels disingenuous or feels wrong. Like, I mean, I know that I have friends who are squillionaires who are way more upper class. and But I'm all, I also know that I have more savings than 99% of America, so, uh, or the whatever, the the majority of the country. So, I don't know, it feels feels like the right thing to do. One of the also really interesting things about your company is, including yourself, the people who run your company are all queer women of color under 30. Has that ever been difficult in terms of dealing with the financial system and the kind of, you know, conservative bank people who you might want to get loans from or even just being taken seriously in the spice industry in general? Absolutely. All the time. I mean, it's an industry that's full of men, usually white men, older white men. Um, We don't look like any of them. Um, And it, it I think in the early days, it was really hard and I had to like fake all kinds of things. I like lied about my age for years. I made up stories about having an imaginary husband for years. You know, I had enough stacked against me showing up on these farms as a queer woman of color that I I wasn't trying to make my life harder. I was just like, do whatever you got to do to get the job done. I think now it's different, but I think it, it, it became an exercise in what are we capable of without their help really and without them and 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 can we take care of us like is our 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 own community is going to show up for this business and going to show up for what our dreams are with this business and the answer was yes like the people that believed in like the fact that both all of our work ethics and our cultural backgrounds and like what we brought to, to the table was more than enough if not like absolutely legendary and unprecedented like our community just like showed up in droves and and it's it's worked and i think at this point now we have enough clout that our identities and, and in any way that that might like disservice us because of the world we live in like doesn't matter as much that's awesome can you say how much you make <laughs> from your business yeah so i i as of last year i make about $120,000 And how did you arrive at that amount? I bought a house and I needed to pay my mortgage and I needed to buy groceries. And I just like counted those two things up. And, you know, at least for now, I support myself and my partner. So I was kind of like, what is my mortgage plus our grocery bill plus a little bit of savings that'll get us to a good point for the next few years without and and balancing not wanting to take too much money away from the company. So it was it was a balance of those two things. And how much does your company do in sales every year? We closed last year at nearly three million. And I so I don't know enough about like how business financials work, yeah. but like is the salary that you're making considered like low for what your company is bringing in, like middle high? Like I think it's considered like pretty middle of the road. Um, most CEOs of friends and family in the industry make significantly more than I do if if roughly the same amount. Because I think where we're at with, with CPG businesses is that like the size of your business and honestly, even the profitability, and I, I don't know that I agree with this model, but this is where I feel like the, the moment is of like the size of your business and its profitability doesn't really matter. The like revenue, like the market share that it has, and then the potential for, you know, total acquirable market, like that's what really matters. And so peers, salaries feel very not linear and very much just like, who knows? Everybody has a different yardstick based on, you know, where they're at in their journey. And I mean, speaking of like bringing in that money and and being successful, you've talked about kind of having mixed feelings about your products promoted by brands like Goop, which is (laughs) Gwyneth Paltrow's kind of much ridiculed, but also very successful lifestyle brand. How do you balance the need, you know, to be marketed and have endorsements from places that you may not necessarily personally align with um, Mm -hmm. and also staying true to yourself? Like on the one hand, like being 
promoted in some way by Goop is is great. great for your business. <laughs> I've grown up a little bit in that respect. You know, I think in the early days, because I, you know, started the company 23, it was, it was about my identity too. And like defining myself as we were defining the business and like figuring out, well, what do I stand for? What does this business stand for? And I think I, I'm definitely more, more of a reluctant capitalist than I was before where I'm like, you know, if they, if they want to hype us and it doesn't hurt us, that's fine please go, go right ahead. Please use our products. And, and ultimately realizing that like, what is the work? The work is our farm partners succeeding. The work is our farm partners, like being able to grow and farm, you know, really sustainably for generations to come. So then kind of whatever enables that and helps that succeed is, is success and is, is good. Talk to me more about, as you said, being a reluctant capitalist, because <laughs> I feel like there's you know, there's often a tension between wanting to be social justice oriented and there's an, you know, expectation that you're anti-capitalist. But, you know, at the same time, like you have a business, the the money that you're bringing in is helping people on the ground in mm -hmm. India, people who traditionally have not been paid well. Yeah. Yeah. What, what kind of how do you conceive of your reluctant capitalism? Oof. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think of it, in, you know, with these are conversations that our team is having constantly. It's like, how do we how do we exist within capitalism while still taking care of ourselves and our needs? It's meant that we're trying to implement like a four day work week right now. And mm, as cool. a business owner, like initially, I felt horrible about that. I was like, well, I need, you know, like max productivity and I need to make sure everybody's delivering like humans are expensive and like i have to make sure and then i had to like check myself and be like what is wrong with you like happy humans who like are... you've become the monster yeah, that like, you what are you <laughs> saying be... sana like think about this and and I, you know i had to sit with myself and be like wait if people are happy about coming to work and kind of giving it their best but also living out the rest of their lives and we're able to be a good job whatever that means in this like very awkward moment that is 2022 um that's great and like if people are able to add better value working four days a week that's great like stop and and i, I had to reframe it in terms of like i think business and capitalism makes you believe that like suffering equates to success and that suffering equates to like harder work and i think i'm really really trying to decouple from that that like nobody has to suffer there no harm has to be inflicted in order to succeed. Um, and that's much harder than I, than I, you know, it sounds easy to say, but I feel like it's all very internalized and, and challenging. I'm curious to know, because I feel like as a person who's only ever been an employee and you're talking to fellow employee friends, like you hear about the the experience of having to negotiate for a raise from that mm. point of view. And I at least don't hear as often from like the business owner, you know, how do they deal with people negotiating for a raise who, who work for them? So I don't know if that's, if, if you've had employees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So yeah. What is it like? Like, like? How do you, how do you, yeah. Figure that out and kind of what's quote unquote fair. Yeah. So, I mean, I make, I make two X our lo lowest salary. So it's, and then kind of in the, in the world of CEOs, that's like wild. Mm -hmm. And, and I think in terms of raises, I'm, I'm actually anti negotiating for a raise in that I want to see kind of that pay parity across the company where like everybody has like bands that they're working within and it's based upon like cost of living plus band and responsibility of work. Um, and so I think what, what, what I'm trying to move us towards is we hired in this like haphazard quick fashion over the past couple of years. Um, people came in at different pay rates and a lot of last year was like about leveling everybody off to make sure that there was equity across the board. And like people were roughly earning the same amount given, you know, what they were doing, the fact that they were full time, stuff like that. With the raise conversations, it's actually been it's been hard for me because like most of our employees feel like my friends. I feel responsible for their success and well-being. I want to give them all the money. Um, so it's 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 been personally hard, but in terms of the the math of the conversation, it's been quite straightforward. Of like, this is the money that we have. This is as high as I can go on this um, at the six month mark. If we have raised money, if our revenue has grown tremendously, 
let's talk about the next bump up. And I, I definitely think we have thrown this idea of like, at least for now in these young stages of the company, we've thrown the idea of like, oh, you know, if you came in at 62, you can only get like a 6% raise or 7% raise. Like that does not matter at all. I don't think that that's fair, especially when people come in and, you know, really transform their roles and bring value in beautiful new ways that you never could have imagined. Like, I think that we we're constantly rewriting our job description and also rechecking in. Like I have one employee who we were talking about a raise or what her, her future looked like. And she was like, actually, like I'd rather not get a raise and do what I'm currently doing, but work less so that I can like farm on the side. Mm -hmm. I was like, sure, you, you should do that. <laughs> that sounds great. Um, so I, I, I don't, I don't know. I'm trying to think as holistically about it as possible and, and see how we can reframe it where there's more equity in it. And just as a thought experiment, like, you know, why is it okay if one person, even though they, they did found the company and, yeah. and shoulder most of the responsibility, you know, make a lot more than the other people who are making it happen? I, I hold on to this idea of like, who's taking the biggest risk? Mm -hmm. a lot where you know if, if if this company went under tomorrow um i would be i would be liable for everything for every debt that we've taken on mm -hmm. um like i i would probably be a, about a million dollars in debt because like all all the company liabilities come to me i personally guar have guaranteed most of our mm -hmm. loans like that feels fair you know mm -hmm. um and then i also think that once we get to a point with the company where people's um inputs are equal everybody let's say everybody's working like a 30 hour work week um equally but like the amount of kind of responsibility that they're having to hold on to the amount of balls they're having to juggle feels equally distributed and we've all talked through like those are the roles we want to hold then i think yeah i think we would get very close to having much more equal kind of pay structures um but i think as yet like i'm the only human working like 16 hour days across two continents um, or like my manager is the only folks doing that. And there are some people in kind of part-time roles, et cetera, who are like, yeah, we'd rather not do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think it's, it's, it's about like responsibility and, uh, and risk. Those are my two big ones. So in terms of your business, um, you've, it's been like a rocket ship. It sounds like, you know, you've, you've grown so many multiples. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how to say that correctly, but you've, <laughs> you've expanded your business a lot <laughs> since mm -hmm. you started just a few years ago. Where do you want this to go? Like in 10, 20 years, do you still see yourself doing this? I don't think I'm, I see myself doing this. I don't think that I'm like necessarily the leader for Diaspora Co. Once we get to a certain size, I'm ultimately like a creative kind of dreamy um, human who doesn't love structure or meetings. And I definitely sometimes feel like a real square peg in a round hole where, you know, my day has meetings scheduled from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. And like uh, I, I live in spreadsheet world and uh, eat very easy to eat meals. Like none of that feels like where I can be my best self or even do my best work necessarily. Um, I think part one is like figuring out, well, how can diaspora allow for me and and everybody on the team to do more of that like to to do more of like slow gentle working that's not like oh, another zoom call mm -hmm. um but then the second part of it is like knowing that that at, at a certain point this company is going to be you know in grocery stores and kind of distributed widely and I don't have the experience to do that, nor really the interest um I think I can add value to the company in a lot of other ways primarily like to our sourcing team and kind of to our where we come from and where we source from. So I'm I'm excited to spend the next couple of years like figuring out how what this company looks like without me. What do you indulge in financially? Ooh, good question. Um, good groceries. I I spend a lot more on groceries than my partner would ever spend, which is why I buy them. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, I, I like to cook. Home cooking is like, I feel like the one thing I do, uh, my salad greens are not going to waste in my crisper drawer. So I feel morally superior about that. Otherwise, I like nice things like I, I, you know, I grew up with two designers for for parents and like they build beautiful buildings. Um, so I, I, I definitely like look at like these art objects and be like, oh, if I had that candle stand, would my life be better? Maybe. <laughs> um, I, yeah. 
I mean, I've seen um, some Instagram pictures of your house, house, like your office, your hot yeah. pink office, which I think <laughs> I saw on this yep. call too. Yep. I love that. <laughs> what does enough look like to you? Mm, I am really clear on this. Enough looks like many to send both of my future children to college because that was a privilege that I was given um, and house. You sound very clear that you want two kids. I do. I really love my family and I, I, I feel excited to have that. Do you have enough right now? No, because I have a lot of business loans that are personally <laughs> guaranteed in my name. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, of course. Thanks for listening to Other People's Pockets. If you like our show so far, it would really help us if you would leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Other People's Pockets is written and hosted by me, Maya Lau. It's produced by me along with Joy Sanford and Dan Gallucci. Production help from Angela Vang. Our mix engineer is Dan Gallucci. Our executive producers are me along with Jane Marie and Dan Gallucci. A special thanks to Coriander. Other People's Pockets is a co-production of Pushkin Industries and Little Everywhere. If you love this show, consider subscribing to Pushkin Plus, offering bonus content and ad-free listening across our network for $4.99 a month. Look for the Pushkin Plus channel on Apple Podcasts or at pushkin.fm. To find more Pushkin podcasts, listen on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. You can sign up for Pushkin newsletters at pushkin.fm. You can find Sana Javeri Kadri on Instagram at Sana Javeri Kadri and find me on Twitter at Maya Lau or on Instagram and TikTok at It's Maya Money. And one more thing, we really want to hear your voices. This week, we want to know what is the strangest way you've ever made money? Leave us a voicemail at 323-540-4255. That's 323-540-4255. Or you can record a voice memo on your phone and email it to us at otherpeoplespockets at gmail.com. <laughs> <laughs>